Hello, my name's Joan Noah and I was born in England in a little village called Horden in County Durham. Uh, Mum was, uh, had loving parents, a loving home. Mum was Anglican, Dad was Catholic and they agreed that the children would be brought up Catholic. Mum taught me my childhood prayers and um, the hymn, There is a Green Hill Far Away. I started school and I came home and told my lovely mother that she was going to hell because she wasn't a Catholic. Um, I had a little sister and um, war started and my dad had to go off to war. He was in the Navy and we didn't see him for four and a half years. We would kiss his photograph every night and say, God bless daddy and bring him safely home. And God did just that. My mum had promised to um, uh, um, bring me up Catholic, and she did, and she never criticised what I was being taught, but she supported me. I found I was a very timid child, and it was there was no concession to being a child. It was very severely taught, and um, we had to know catechism, this little booklet of the, the, the tenets of the Catholic faith. And I would bring this book home and ask my mother to ask me any question in this book because we were going to have a religious exam. And she'd say, you don't need to know this, Joan. Yes, yes, we're going to have a religious exam. And I was never once asked a question in, in, in a religious exam. And my mum said, I'm sure the teacher must tell the priest, the little children that don't know the catechism. I, we had to go to quite a number of services on Sunday and uh, you had to kneel on wooden benches and you could not rest against the back of the bench and I would fail quite often because it, it, it was, and the mass was in Latin, again it wasn't child friendly, you were not, there was no concession made to children, it was a, an adult situation and you just didn't feel love the way we were being taught. I would visit my grandparents, my dad's parents who were elderly, and and it was like the Spanish Inquisition. What had I done? Had I done this? And and I would come home and tell my mum, they don't love me. She said, yes, they do. I said, no, they don't. It was it was quite Dickensian, the whole lot, you know. But however, I, I said my prayers and continued in the Catholic faith. Dad came home from war. We got a baby brother. Uh, we moved to a town. He was five years old. Mum enrolled him in the state school. I don't know why she did that, but Mum did, and he was doing well. He liked it. And then I came home, I think I was 17 at this time, and I said to my mother, if he dies and loses his soul, you will go to hell. And with that, my mum took him out of the school and enrolled him in the Catholic school. Uh, fast forward to or some years and I was in my early 20s and my lovely friends Joan and Mike, a young couple, were emigrating to New Zealand. It was January, snow was on the ground, it's, the winters are very harsh where I come from. And on the spur of the moment I said, oh, wish I was coming with you. And Mike said, do something about it then. Right, fast forward to uh, May 1960 and I was on the first flight, emigration flight to New Zealand it was dusk. I was arriving in Auckland at dusk. I looked down. I could see the shape of the land and the little twinkling lights. And I thought, oh, I love it. And I've never changed my mind. I just love New Zealand. I was a homebody. I had never left home. I was never homesick. It was just wonderful. I was just so happy in New Zealand. Um, I got married. And eight years later, the marriage was over and I was devastated, absolutely shattered. And when a marriage breaks up, your life is absolutely severed. You lose your husband, your home, your friends. It, you have to start all over again. Um, my mother came and she was a great support to me. She lived in Christchurch. She took a job as a cook in a hostel for 72 girls. She was just a housewife. And with my mother's support, I was able to leave that, uh, the home. She said, I'm not going to interfere, Joan. I'm here if you want me. And she didn't come near the house. But with her support, I, I had the gumption to leave. Um, and with my mother's support, I learned to live again. One day I noticed that the trees were in bloom. And I thought, oh, it's spring. And I was emerging from this deep black hole I'd been in. Um, 
Well, uh, life continued. I, um, you know, life um, made life for myself. Nine years later, I met a lovely man. We got married, and I found out what it was like to be happily married. My friend Mike, my lovely friend Mike, when he was 40, he was diagnosed with cancer and he died. And we were all devastated. They had three boys, and Joan was, you know, a young widow. She joined a church, and I went along with her. She lived in Napier. I went along to this church. It was very nice. So when I went back to Wellington, there was a card from the, the pastor. It said, Dear Joan, thank you for worshipping with us when you were in Napier. We would like to think that if you come and live here, you would worship, make your spiritual home with us. I thought, isn't that lovely? So with that, I went along to the local church, and I, the people were welcoming, and I, I, I loved it, and... I was visiting my family in Auckland at Christmas, and um, I'd, they'd said, oh, there's this lovely church in Auckland you must go to on Christmas Eve. So I said, Dad, I want to go to this church on Christmas Eve. And he said, I wouldn't take a gold pig and drive on the roads in Chris at Christmas. My sister was visit, and I told him about this church I'd been going to. And my sister looked at me in horror and said, listen to her, Dad, she's going on just like one of the nuns. And I thought, oh, I've gone over the top. And with that, I never went to that church again. Completely stopped going to the church. Well, um, nine years later, I, as, as I said, I met this lovely man. We got married and happily married. And we retired, found beautiful Omar Karoa, built a lovely house on the, the uh, Gerald Crap Reserve, a, a lovely green reserve in front of us with lots of trees. And we were going to have a big family reunion in this new house at Christmas. 13 people staying with us, two caravans on site. And on the 12th of December, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. And the um, specialist said he would operate on the 21st of January when he came back from holiday. We decided we wouldn't tell our visitors. And um, I'd get occasionally a little bit tired, so I'd disappear for half an hour, have a rest, and nobody sort of missed me or realised anything funny was going on. I had the operation, and um, one night I, I, I really started to pray the Lord's Prayer and thought about every word I was saying. And um, it really meant something to say the Lord's Prayer that night. The next day, um, it was a private hospital, um, a lady came into my room and I'm looking at her and thinking, don't talk to me, please don't talk to me. And she didn't, she stood and they didn't approach me, she stood in the centre of the room and she said very quietly, I have wonderful support, I'm Christian. And with that she came towards me and I had lures in my hand and she, the little part of my hand that she could touch, with two fingers she softly stroked my hand and it was like a bird's wing, it was so gentle. Then I didn't want her to talk to me, I started to talk to her. I said, we've just had the most wonderful Christmas, but the real meaning of Christmas wasn't recognized in our house. So um, I said, do you know the hymn, God Be In My Head? She said, yes, Joan, I'm the organist at church, I play that. So she said, look, Joan, we're all living under an umbrella of God's love. And tomorrow the sun is going to shine just for you. Look, find a little church to go to. And with that, she sort of disappeared. She came to see me twice more. She never mentioned religion or her faith again. The next time she came in, it was to tell me. She said, look, Joan, there's a full moon tonight. Open your blinds and look at the moon. And I was in Norfolk Hospital with lots of Norfolk pine trees, and there was the moon shining through. The, it was the most beautiful sight. She really uplifted my spirits, you know. And another time she came in to tell me that somebody called Tenduka, a great um, cricketer, was going to be on TV. Was I going to watch that? I said, no, I'm going to watch um, the interview about Sarah Ferguson. Are you going to watch that? No, she said, that's the gutter press. And I thought, well, isn't she right? That's exactly what it is, the gutter press. Well, I never saw that lady again. Obviously, she was probably ready to go home because she was fully dressed. Well, a lady came to examine my, my uh, operation. I had a bag and her eyes filled with tears. And I clutched her by the hand and I said, my dear, you're too sensitive for this job. 
But she knew something I didn't know. This bag had been placed in the wrong place. It, instead of being placed on a flat part of me, it had been placed in my waistband. Now you put something flat on a ba uh, curve, it will not stick. And that bag never stuck on my on me. And you know, Exeter was coming. It was uh, we didn't know this. So I, home I go, and I was quite quite ill. I had an infection which wasn't recognised. The doctor was coming to see me, and I think he thought I was a mad woman, because I'd be quite delirious at times. Meanwhile, this bag kept coming off. The district nurse was coming three times a day to put this bag on me again, and at night when it came off, my poor husband had to put this bag back on me. And after three weeks of this going on, one night he said, why are you doing this to yourself? And I thought, oh, I've worn him out. Who's going to help me? The nurse couldn't, the doctor couldn't, and now Les was worn out. Who is going to help me? And then I thought, oh, it says in the Bible, ask and you will receive. I thought, is this what you have to do? And with that, I got a man's name in my head, Stuart Christie. Now, we knew Stuart Christie as a, an indoor bowler. So next morning, I said to my husband, give Stuart Christie a ring. And he said, and what do you think he's going to do? I said, I have no idea. Just give him a ring. So he rang Stuart and Stuart said, sorry to hear Joan's been sick. What can I do to help? So my husband said, well, I like the man's attitude. So it was arranged that I was better in the morning, so Stuart would come. So I went out to the back terrace, and as he approached, I was there waiting for him with a Bible in my hand. And I said, do you know how to read the Bible? I don't know how to read the Bible. He said, no, Joan, you've been very sick. I said, you don't understand. It says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am also. Can you bless me? Bless Les, bless this house. We are in hell here. So he, he motioned, we, went, we sat down, and um, I told him my background, a loving home, my parents, op op well, Anglican, Catholic, but never any dissent in the house. It was a loving house, never any problems with, with religion. But I said, you know, um, I heard, um, I said, is there anything in it, Stuart? Is there anything in it? I heard a young doctor being interviewed on radio and he um, had a patient who had severe heart problems and he was the school bus driver. So the doctor told him he must not drive the bus and the man continued to do it. And the doctor was so concerned he went to the press. And because of that, the medical council would not allow him to practice. And for a year he hadn't been practicing medicine. So um, he on the radio he was saying he was having to go to before a panel to be questioned and on the panel it was a psychiatrist who would be asking him if he was a Christian and if he was that was a black mark against him. That young man committed suicide. Well I'm questioning Stuart and he, he um, about how did you read the Bible he said well look start with Romans so I went and got a paper and start with Romans and then John and I'm writing this down so we moved to a further part of the terrace and we sat down and he got me to read Nicodemus this this story of Nicodemus now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a member of the Jewish ruling council he came to Jesus at night and said Rabbi we know you are a teacher who's come from God, for no one can, can perform miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. And in reply, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. And so it is with everyone born of the spirit. And with that, I'm looking at the trees. I could see the wind blowing. And just like that, my doubts disappeared, and I believed. It was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Then Stuart got me to read in Romans where it said, if you, can, if you 
can declare with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. And I was so happy. And so Stuart came into the house to bless Les and I, put his arms around us both, just said a very simple prayer of blessing. And I was so happy. And I said to my husband, you've got to tell my parents, who are now living in Australia, you've got to tell my dad, I don't know what, that I've become a Christian. So Stuart, we would ring on alternative weeks, dad one week and Les the next. I didn't have the energy to speak to them at this stage. So Les said, Joan wants you to know she's become a Christian. And my father said, who is this man that's got a hold of our Joan? And I've discovered that people are more scared of the word Christian than they are of the word cancer. When I was first diagnosed with cancer, I... I, I was so I felt so desperately alone. It's a, a terribly isolating feeling. Nobody can understand what you're going through. And I had found a little verse of scripture in the paper, and it it said, "Cast your cares upon the Lord, and He will sustain you." And I had that on my dressing table, and I would read it every day, and it gave me strength. Cast your cares on the Lord; He will sustain you. And that was something I hung on to. Well, Stuart. Um, as he, he didn't come to see me anymore, but as he was walking by, he'd wave, leading a walking group, or he'd leave a little tract in the letterbox. Um, I had to go to um, Waikato Hostel for six weeks of treatment, chemo and radiation, Monday to Friday. And um, there was a little dog, the matron had a little white dog, and I would take this little dog for a walk. And one day I was so tired, I thought, I've got to sit down all four down. And the only seat was a, a, a little seat and two Maori men were sitting at the end, talking to a man in a wheelchair. So I sat as far away from them as I could. And I couldn't help overhearing what they were saying. And they were sharing the good news with the man in the wheelchair. I felt terrible. Um, then one day I was being positioned on the bed in, in line for my radiation treatment. And the nurse said, how are you, Mrs. Noah? And I said, I think I'd like to go to church, but I think I might cry. She said, well, it's obviously important to you. Wait till you get home and see how you feel. I came home on the Friday, opened the door, the phone rang, and it was Stuart. He said, Joan, I'm preaching on Sunday at church. Would you like to come? I thought, oh, well, I can look at, I can look at Stuart. I didn't have to look at a man in a white collar. So I said, Stuart, there's something you must know about me. I've been divorced, and I don't know what your church's attitude is to divorce. He said, Joan, God isn't going to judge you. He's God of love. So with that, I went along to the church, and um, it was a lovely service. And afterwards, we had a cup of tea, and, and everyone was friendly. And it was so lovely. I went the following week, and lo and behold, there was the minister in all his regalia. But he had a guitar, and he was a charismatic Anglican. Again, it was a lovely service. And as I was leaving and shook his hand, I said, I've often been going to come to your church for social reasons, but I'm here for the right reason now. And he said, oh, any reason's good enough to come to church. Stuart invited me to his home group, and I went along. And um, uh, we, we um, had a few verses of hymns, and then we would do Bible study. And um, Stuart's teaching was so deep, I bought myself a Bible. And I told him, I said, Stuart, I bought my, a Bible. Right, he said, now make, some, now make some marks in it. I was a book lover. I never defaced books. but. When Stuart made a, a special point, I would make a note and underline things that spoke to me. And it, it was just wonderful. We'd pray for special uh, purposes of people and, and, and things. It was just so wonderful. This went on for some months. And then one evening, Stuart left the room and a retired minister who had joined our group said to us all, have you ever had to do something you didn't want to do, <clears throat> but you had to do it for the benefit of the group. And I thought, no, I've never had to do that. But I had to do it before the night was out because the group was divided geographically and I was on the wrong side of the... Ge so I had to leave Stuart's group and join another study group. 
I continued going to church and one day the um, sermon was about the ten virgins, of ten foolish ones and the ten wise virgins and I thought, I just thought, I want to make a commitment and I talked to the minister about it and I was baptised in the sea in Omokoroa and it was just lovely, really lovely. Looking back, I see how God's protected me all my life and he's been there in the two most harrowing times of my life, cancer and my husband's recent death. If anyone had told me it was possible to be at peace and not feel alone, although I am, I wouldn't have believed it. Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. And he has and is comforting me. Jesus also said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus strengthens and gives me courage and has done so at the most desperate times when I've needed him, he's been there. Why do I love Jesus? As my hospital friend said, I have wonderful support, I'm Christian. Jesus is my Lord and Saviour and also my friend and brother. He's all I need. I thank him for patiently waiting until I was 58 to truly believe in him. And I thank him for all I couldn't, I couldn't, I thank him for all he's done for me and I couldn't live without him. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for your testimony. Could I ask you one more question? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. Well, maybe there's someone listening who's been very religious. Very religious. But haven't been born again. Uh-huh. What would you say to them? Well, it has to be a personal... I, I don't know. I mean, Jesus came to me at a crisis in my life. I had all that religious background, upbringing. And, um, but I didn't know the love of Jesus, really. Um, it has to be a personal personal um, revelation I think at a great crisis what no nothing no one or nothing could have helped me except Jesus and he saved me um, and and I, as I said to a, a dear friend of mine a Dutch friend I said unless I'd got cancer I would not have become a Christian and she said oh don't you worry Joan God had his hand on you <laughs> so really just uh, uh, perhaps they don't know they haven't they haven't been born again perhaps they don't know jesus said you have to be born again but if people are true they're believing and they're saying they're attending their church and they they are believing but i, I don't know I, I can't explain it um I don't know how many Catholic people are born again. I don't know. All his life, my dad had been saying, well, is there anything in it? I don't know. Nobody's ever come back to tell us. And dad was in hospital awaiting heart surgery when he had this massive heart attack. And he was in agony. And then there was this light. And he was going to this light. And it was wonderful. And it was for him. And the next minute, he was back in agony. And they were saying, Mr. Fail, this is very, very serious. They broke his ribs. They resuscitated him. They brought him back. He had died and they brought him back to life. So there was Dad's answer. Is there anything after... He, he knew now that there is something after this, you know? When was that? That was towards the end of his no, life? No, 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 no. That was... Oh, gosh. That was about 16 years before he died. 16 years before he died. Yeah, yeah. But it still took him some time to It took him believe. a lot. It's still... He still, you know, he, he, he said to me, you know, Christianity's dead. It's, it's, it's gone, you know, it's dead. And then I took him to this little church and it was so humble, it was a school hall. And um, uh, the organist hadn't arrived and so uh, a man had to stand up and sing unaccompanied and he sang, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused such pain. It was the most, and he was a bass baritone, which my father was. And then the next hymn was, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I said, Right, Dad, you can sing this one. So Dad sang that one. And then he picked up the little um, 
good news Bible which has got illustrations in it. And he said, oh, this is interesting. So when I came back home to New Zealand, I went and bought um, a modern uh, large print Bible and sent it to my father in Australia. And he wrote back and thanked me, he said, I'll treasure this all the days of my life. On my next holiday, I said, oh, can I borrow the Bible, Dad? I'm doing a study. So I, I came downstairs and he said, right, what's the reading for today? I said, oh, though outwardly we are fading away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And my father died with me in the garden that week. And, and it was just wonderful because my father was a believer at the end. You know, my mother, she had the answer all along. She said to me in the latter years of her life, he has never let me down. He has never, he has never let me down. He's always been there for me. And my mother, she was baptized, uh, confirmed in the Anglican church, Anglican church when she was about 35 with her two sisters. So obviously she was reading her Bible, but not, not influencing me because I was Catholic and that was separate. So my mother, was Christian all those years and I didn't recognize she was the most loving patient mother you know she looked after my baby sister and I and her invalid mother while my dad was away at war and she was only about 28 you know and she was just she was just an angel my mum we, we lived in a, um, a house with cold water a coal fire she had to light the fire before she could cook anything and I went to school crying one day. Why was I crying? Because I had to go to school eating apple fritters. And my mother had had to get up, light the fire, bake the batter, peel the apples, fry them, give them to this child who was crying because she didn't want them. And you know, she never lost her patience with me. I had no confidence as a child, but she was always encouraging and never criticizing. Yes, my mother was just the most wonderful lady, and she had the answer all along. She was Christian, and and my dad and I had to we had to take it the hard way, you know, before we found out. Dear Lord, um, as I prayed, ask and you will receive. I pray that anyone who is in need and would love to know you, that you would get, you would touch their hearts and and they would come to know you because you are you give strength and courage and support M my life is just wonderful with you in it when i look back i think how i was filling my life and you know i had a wonderful life but really without you in it, it, it there was a lot missing so i pray lord that um anyone who is in need that they say the Lord's Prayer like I did and God will answer you. He'll send someone to to touch you like I was touched by Stuart because there are loving people out there willing to to help you to know to know the Lord. In Jesus name I pray this. Amen.